So the third aspect of summarizing data, particularly for numeric data that we need to think about, is what is the shape of the data? What is the pattern or the kind of picture of the data as a whole? So we talked about typicality first and then variability. Now we're on to shape. So shape, as I said, is just thinking about the shape or the pattern of the distribution of the spread of scores. And there's two kinds of ways that we can think about shape, two sort of different ways of representing shape. The first one is the, the amount of skew in the distribution. So if you have a perfectly symmetrical distribution, it doesn't have any skew in it. If you have a skewed distribution, it means that the two sides aren't the same shape. So I'll demonstrate what I mean by this in a couple of slides time. But if you had a graph and you folded it in half, if the two sides were the same pattern with the same kind of shape, then that means it's, it's a symmetrical distribution. You can have different types of skew. You can have a positive skew or a negative skew. And I'll talk to you about what that is when we get to that point. The second aspect of shape is something that's called a kurtosis, which I'm sure you possibly haven't heard about before. And that's representing how peaked or pointy the distribution is compared to how flat and unpeaked or unpointy it is. And again, I'll demonstrate what I mean by that in a second. Okay, shape. So when we're thinking about shape, what we're expecting for numeric, um, which are quantitative variables, what we're expecting is that most of the time they're going to be what I'm going to call normally distributed. And what I mean by normally distributed is that it follows a normal curve shape, a bell curve shape. And I've got a picture of that down the bottom of this slide. The reason it's called a normal distribution is because that's quite typical of things in the world, particularly when we think about biological variables or physiological variables. If we were to take a sample of people's heart rate or their blood pressure or physiological things like that, what we find is that most people tend to score or tend to have a value in the middle of the distribution and there's fewer people as you get to the, to the kind of um, ends of the distribution on either side. So most people have quite similar scores, only a small proportion of people have quite unusual scores. So that's why it's called a normal distribution, because it tends to be how variables normally fall or how they normally look. And the ideal normal distribution is represented in this graph down the bottom there. So this is very similar to the bar chart that we looked at before, but we're going to talk about um, these kinds of graphs that I'm going to define as a histogram in a second. What this is representing is the same kind of thing that the bar chart was representing in that it's looking at how many people have a variety of scores. The x-axis, which remember is the horizontal axis, the one that goes from left to right um, in a histogram, is the particular variable that we're talking about, the point on the scale that we're talking about. So we've got lower scores on the variable down the left-hand side, we've got higher scores on the variable up the right-hand side. And how tall the peak goes is dictated by how many people have that particular score. So in this case, looking at this particular graph, what we find is that most observations fall in the middle of the distribution around the average, the mean of the distribution. And that's represented by how tall the peak is in the middle, how far it goes up the graph. And then fewer people have really low scores fewer people have really high scores. So the majority of people have quite similar scores in the middle. The further away from the middle you get, the fewer observations there are that fall in that particular part of the scale. And this normal distribution is really, really important for a lot of the stats stuff we're gonna be talking about because it's actually quite fundamental to the process of significance testing and hypothesis testing that we're going to be doing. So it's basically essentially what statistical testing is about. It's about a normal distribution. So get very familiar with the shape of this curve, less so with the ghost one, but you know, whatever you get up to in your own time is your own choice. Um, because we're going to be talking about normal distributions quite a lot. Okay, so the next thing that I wanna show you is um, different ways that a distribution can be abnormal or it can be not particularly perfect, not as perfect as the one up the top there. 
And the first thing to talk about is the shape of the distribution. And a distribution that has a perfect shape is called a symmetrical distribution. So a symmetrical distribution is exactly the same on the left side of the mean as it is on the right side of the mean. So it looks the same on both sides. An asymmetrical distribution is a skewed distribution. And a skewed distribution has a longer tail on one side than it does on the other. So to give you some examples here, the pink graph on the left hand side here is what's called a negatively skewed distribution or a left skewed distribution. So the reason that it's called a negative skew or a left skew is because that's the direction that the tail goes off in. The tail being the long skinny bit that's pulling the distribution down. The peak of the distribution is the opposite of the tail, it's on the other side of the tail. So you can see for the pink graph on the left hand side here, the peak of the distribution, the bulk of the data is up the top end and the tail is pulled down to the left or the negative side, the negative side of the scale. So <coughs> pardon me. So it's called a negatively skewed distribution or a left skewed distribution. The one in the middle is the symmetrical distribution. That's neither left nor right skewed. It's not skewed at all. It's symmetrical. And that means that if you were to draw a line down the middle, the left side is pretty much the same as the right side. It might not be perfectly, perfectly the same, particularly when we start looking at real data. Real data is never perfectly smooth like these fake drawings are. Um, but a symmetrical distribution is pretty much the same on the left as the right. At the top here in the blue graph, we'd have a positively skewed distribution or a right skewed distribution. So again, the direction of the skew is the direction that the tail is going on. So in this case, for this blue one, the tail is up the top end, which is the positive end of the scale, or the right side of the scale. So that's why it's a positive or a right skewed distribution. So um, negatively skewed or positively skewed distributions aren't symmetrical. Um, and as you'll see in a couple of slides time, being a symmetrical or an approximately symmetrical distribution is one of the features or one of the components of a normal distribution. Things that I've talked about a little bit thus far um, is how the measures of typicality, the mean, the median and the mode, get affected by skews or get affected by outliers. So being affected by skews is the same principle as if they were affected by outliers like we talked about earlier. So the mean score, the arithmetic average, that's the most affected, the most compromised by skews. The mode tends to be the least affected. And this is just a representation of how those measures of typicality get affected by skews. So on the left hand side, we've got a left skew and negatively skewed distribution. And you can see that because there are more unusual scores as you go down the left hand side, the mean tends to get pulled down towards the direction of the skew. The mode, because it's the most common score, if you have more unusual scores but they're not particularly well represented in that there's not that many um, observations that have the same score, then the mode doesn't care at all. The, mo the mode is never going to change. Um, it's always going to stick with the most common score. Same principle but for right skew, positively skewed distributions. So if the tail gets pulled up the right hand side, then again the mean's going to get pulled down towards that. So the next aspect of shape to talk about, we just talked about the skew versus symmetry, is kurtosis. And the kurtosis is talking about how pointy or peaked versus how flat and kind of mole shaped um, the distribution is. So a normal distribution, the one in the middle, is called a mesokurtic distribution and it's the black one in the middle here. It's the one that's not extreme in either direction. So mesokurtic is a normal distribution, is the kind of normal average one. Leptokurtic is the very extremely tall distribution. So you can see that the blue graph, it rises quite quickly, it rises quite steeply, peaks up the tallest, and then falls down quite steeply on the other side. And you can think about leptokurtic as if it's lepto, it's leaping, it's kind of leaping up, so it's going up quite high and then down quite fast. Mesokurtic is the one in the middle, so that's meso. And the platycurtic distribution is the flat one. So it's the flat one that's not particularly high, doesn't really peak up. It stays quite low to the ground. And you can think of plat flat 
or alternatively you can think of it like a platypus it kind of looks like a platypus on its side so that's ketosis ketosis is another aspect of the shape of a distribution and again a normal distribution is the mesocotic one it's the one that's in the middle it's not extremely tall it's not extremely flat so um, I mentioned a couple times so far that if we're thinking about a normal distribution, there are certain features of a normal distribution and there's five specific features or components that make up a normal distribution. And these are the ones listed here. So the first thing is that a normal distribution has to have variability. What that means is that all of the observations can't have the same score. There has to be a range of scores or a variance in scores or a spread of scores. There has to be some difference in the scores. So you can see here on the left hand side, this is a histogram that Stata has made for me. This is a distribution with variance. So you can see we're measuring people's blood pressure here that it ranges from 90 up to 130. There is a range of scores, a spread of scores. The graph on the right hand side is showing everybody has the same blood pressure of 100. So you have to have variability in order to have a normal distribution. There has to be a spread of scores or a range of scores. Secondly, a normal distribution is unimodal. And unimodal just means that there's only one peak in it. So we talked about the mode earlier, the mode being the most common observation. Um, a unimodal distribution just means that there is one particular peak. There aren't multiple peaks and there aren't no peaks. So you can see here that the bimodal distribution goes up and down and up and down twice. So bimodal, two modes. The multimodal distribution on the right hand side goes up and down three times. So multimodal just means multiple modes. The uniform distribution shows no actual peak. So there's just a, a uniform, a flat um, kind of consistency in the peak and then it falls down on either sides. So there's actually no particular peak in the middle. So a normal distribution has to be unimodal. It has to have only one peak. Again, when we start looking at real data, um, you'll see that what I mean by one peak means no obvious multiple peaks. Sometimes the data kind of vary a little bit. Um, and again, I'll show you an example of that when we actually get to talking about this in a few weeks time. But for it to be multimodal, that means it has multiple distinct peaks, multiple clear peaks and breaks in the data. So unimodal, only one peak. The third aspect, which is kind of related to, to modality, is that a normal distribution has to have central tendency. What that means is that there has to be some kind of peak or some kind of rise of scores somewhere towards the middle of the distribution. There has to be a, a kind of peak in the middle where the majority of the scores fall and then some kind of um, kind of falling down of tails on either side. So a distribution that lacks central tendency is like this one here. There's no clear peak in the middle. There's kind of a variety of scores that kind of goes up and down a bit and there's no clear rising and falling in the distribution. So normal distribution has to have central tendency. The other two that we've already talked about are symmetry and ketosis. So a normal distribution also has to be symmetrical or approximately symmetrical. Um, and mesocotic, so not platycotic or leptocotic. Okay, um, taking a side note for graphs, just the, for the end of this lecture, I've talked about a few different kinds of graphs thus far. So we've talked about a, bi a bar chart, a pie chart, and also histograms. Um, remember that a bar chart and a pie chart were the kinds of graphs for categorical variables, whereas a histogram was the kind of graph for a um, quantitative, a numeric variable. I just want to cover one more, um, and it just made sense to do it at the end, so we're going to do it at the end, um, which is called a box plot, or also called a box and whisker plot, depending on who you talk about. Um, we will talk about more kinds of graphs further on in the semester, but this is um, just the ones that we were talking about today. So these are all the univariate graphs, remember, just looking at one variable at a time, the summary of one variable at a time. Okay. So this is a box plot, a box and whisker plot on the left-hand side. The right hand side is a histogram of the exact same data. So um, remember that you can summarize the same data in multiple different kinds of ways. And what's most appropriate tends to depend on what it is you're trying to achieve. So there's going to be a difference between a histogram and a box plot in that the box plot specifically depicts the median and the interquartile range. Whereas the histogram tends to be used more in line with the mean and the standard deviation of a distribution. So the point of having these two graphs here is just to show you two different ways of summarizing the same data. Histogram on the right, box plot on the left. So the box plot here 
if you see the solid line or the solid-ish line in the middle of the box, the box is the thing in the middle, that's the median score. So remember the median is the middle most score if you were to rank the scores from the smallest to biggest. And the solid colour which makes up the box, this is our 25th percentile at the bottom. Sorry, I've lost my mouse. 25th percentile down the bottom and the 75th percentile up the top. So remember before we talked about the interquartile range, the box here, the width of the box, represents the size of the interquartile range. The lines at the top and the bottom of the box plot represent the limits of the majority of the data. Um, there are exceptions to that, and I'm showing you an example on the next slide here, where you do have some dots either above the top line or below the bottom line, and those are representing your outliers, outliers being particularly unusual data points. So the outliers um, are defined mathematically as one and a half times the interquartile range above or below the whisker next to it. Um, and what that just means is it's a, it's a mathematical definition for particularly unusual points. So as you'll see, sometimes you don't see outliers, like on the previous slide, sometimes you do see outliers. And those are just points that are quite far away from the middle of the distribution. Um, I don't know if this is your first introduction to the Mark Wahlberg stats memes, but if it is, then welcome. There's gonna be a lot more to come. Um, they're just, they're just